Hey, good morning. Welcome here to Central. As always, there are a lot of folks joining us by live streaming Kai Theater, or maybe out in the Family Life Center. Good to have everyone with us today. A lot of folks here in person. If you got a Bible with you, let's take it and let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And today we're going to pick up in verse 11 as we are in a series teaching through the book of Ephesians, uh, which is called True Identity. The title of today's message is really moving from the enemy of God uh, to becoming the family of God and what that means and what that uh, looks like. Now, uh, in my family, uh, we, we are the Mason family. So I got two sons and I got three grandsons. Well, in the Mason family, if you're part of our blood, part of our kin, uh, you know the code to the garage, you know the code to the alarm, uh, you have free access to the house. Uh, if you're out uh, during the day, if my boys are out roaming around doing whatever, Ty or Taylor, and they decide they want a snack, and they know their daddy's got some Twinkies or something hidden somewhere, uh, and milk in the refrigerator, they can come, they can get in. Uh, all they have to do is clean up their mess when they leave the house. Now, we have one son, I won't mention his name, but I can always tell if he's been there because the Twinkie wrapper will be where it was, the glass of milk, empty glass will be there. And so I can usually call him and go, hey, you came by the house today. He'll go, how do you know? I said, I can tell you've been there. But hey, there are privileges and benefits to being part of the Mason family, being a part of the blood kin uh, of the Masons. Well, sometimes what happens spiritually in regard to us as believers, we have a identity confusion about who we are uh, as followers of Christ, especially when it even comes to being the family of God. We don't really realize, uh, even when we gather together on Sunday morning, what that is. This is a corporate worship gathering. We're gathering on Sunday, the day uh, that the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead early uh, on Sunday. Sunday morning. The New Testament churches always come together uh, on Sunday. We are part of God's family. We are a local faith family. We are a local body. We are connected together. And as you're going to see uh, in a moment, we're connected by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been moved from once being enemies of the Lord God, and we've been moved into the family of God. And so what does it look like to be part of that family of God? What is our identity uh, in that? How should we respond to that? Uh, how should should we be living our lives? And again, that's what we're going to see in this passage. Now, again, if you're new at Central, uh, my name is Archie. I'm a senior lead pastor. We have been standing for the public reading of Scripture for about 16 years. And uh, if you're physically able, I'm not planning on stopping uh, anytime soon. So if you don't mind, would you stand up with me uh, for the public reading of the Word of God? Here we go, verse 11. Therefore, Remember, this is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, you're called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Now look at verse 19. So then, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Join me as we pray. Father. Again, we just say thank you. We thank you for breath. We thank you for life. We thank you that we're here. Uh, Holy Spirit, uh, we need you to speak to us today. Holy Spirit, we need illumination of this passage. Lord, we need uh, understanding of this passage. Uh, Lord Jesus, I pray this morning that, uh, man, I pray that uh, people are drawn to you. I pray, uh, Lord Jesus, you encourage those who are believers, but I pray you save uh, those who are unbelievers. Lord, I pray that today people become a part 
of your family. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name, the name of Christ, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated. Again, thanks for standing for the uh, public reading uh, of Scripture. You know, sometimes on Sundays, you kind of look at it and you think, man, it's like uh, it's the last service of the day. We got some fried chicken and some good sweet iced teas coming and fried potatoes. I just got everybody excited about lunch, didn't I? So uh, that, but you know, sometimes what we miss out on the Lord's Day and the church gathering together and us being the family of God is that somebody today whether in person that's here out in the Family Life Center or joining us by live stream, do you realize that somebody today is going to be grafted, adopted into the family of God? Somebody today is going to be saved. Somebody today is going to repent of their sins. Somebody today is going to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are going to become a part of God's family. That's why I get excited about Sundays, about the corporate gathering uh, of believers and what the Lord does. But here's what we got to learn. Okay, so we were enemies and now we are the family of God. So again, Paul reminds us of who we once used to be, that we were enemies of the Lord. That's why he starts out there in verse 11. He says, therefore, remember. Now, if you were here last week, uh, we were in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And just recap very quickly. Now, he starts off when he's writing to the church at Ephesus. He says, you know, at one time you were uh, dead in your trespasses and sins. Trespass, you've deviated. You've gone the wrong way. Sins, you've missed the mark. We talked about that we're born with a sinful nature. We really don't have to teach children uh, how to do wrong. We have to teach them how to do right. Any of us have been parents, we know that. There is a, a nature that they're born with. They may grab one another's toys or they may bite your leg or something. I mean, I don't know. You know how kids are. So you don't have to teach them to do uh, what's wrong. You have to teach them to do what's right. It's because we have a sinful nature. But also what uh, the Spirit, speaking through Paul, the inspired Word of God for us, he says, and you walked according to this world. You walked according to the prince of the power there. And we talked about how you're either in the camp of Jesus or you're in the camp of Satan. And I share it with you, you know, a lot of times people, their body language, they kind of flinch when we say that because some people say, well, hey, I'm not that bad, Archie. Uh, I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I don't have pointed ears. I don't carry a pitchfork and I'm not demonically possessed. And, you know, I'm not a bad person. Well, I understand what you're saying and you don't have pointed ears and a pitchfork. I get it. But the Bible tells us we're dead in trespasses and sins, that, that we are really the walking dead spiritually and that we belong to the enemy. We belong to the course of this world. I've shared with you too. I know that, again, just events are taking place around our world and the things that we see and happening, but realize it's the spirit of the Antichrist uh, is at work out there that, <clears throat> excuse me, the culmination of history is coming to a close at some point. Now, that means Jesus is coming back. Does that mean it's going to happen next week? I don't know. Does that mean it's going to happen 10 years from now? I don't know. Does that mean it's going to happen 100 years from now? I don't know. Is he coming back? Yes, that's what we know, okay? It's a culmination here. So it's the spirit of the Antichrist is at work when you see those things happening. We see the course of the world. We know the enemy uh, is behind a lot of this stuff that's going on taking place. So Paul reminds him of who they were, and then he gets to verse 4. He says, but God being rich in his mercy. Now, when you go down through that, and we finished up on verse 10 last week where his workmanship in Christ, he's created that way. When you get to verse uh, 11, he reminds them again. He says, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles, you were called the uncircumcision. Apparently, what was happening at the church of Ephesus in the context of this, there was some disunity that was occurring between those uh, who were uh, Jews who had come to faith in Christ and those who were the Gentiles, okay, who had come to faith in Christ. There was a little bit of disunity there, maybe in the church's current. So he's reminding the Gentiles of what the Lord uh, has done in their life. Now, I don't know your background. I don't know all your ethnicity. I don't know exactly where all of you are from, but I think I can probably say the majority of us, it's not 100% of us, would be referred to as Gentiles. I don't know if anybody here uh, could trace their heritage back as a Jew. Uh, we know uh, that a lot of records were restored in 70 AD uh, there when the temple uh, was burned and that stuff. So I would say most of us are Gentiles. I know my ancestry is from Scotland. Uh, in fact, uh, my daddy has shared with me, you know, Masons are bricklayers. That's how we got our name, and that's not why I have the bricks here. But anyway, that's where that name comes from. And apparently my dad, he told me this. He says, the people from Scotland, our ancestors, do not like us. He says he's reached out to them. He's tried to contact them. He's wrote them. They will not respond to us. In fact, I think what happened is our ancestor defected during a revolutionary war and became part of the United States of America. And so 
That's why they don't like us very much. So I don't know about you, but we're all mixed up. So we got Scottish, we got some Indian, we got all kinds of stuff flowing uh, in our brains. Most of us are like that. So most of us would be considered uh, Gentile. So Paul, when he's writing, he says, just remember uh, who you are. You had the group of the Jews who'd been circumcised by the flesh. You were considered to be the uncircumcised. The Jewish people, when the Lord uh, chose them, and we can say there's nothing, it was the Lord's choice. It, it wasn't anything that we say was good or they could merit it, but the Lord chose to work through Abraham and he called him. And so we had the Jewish people and the Lord set them apart. Uh, he gave them dietary laws to follow. Uh, he gave them dress, certain dress, uh, even uh, to wear. Uh, he told them not to get involved with anyone around them, not to marry or intermarry with other people because, man, there was pagans. There were people who uh, worshiped false gods. There were folks around the Jewish people who sacrificed their children to Molech, a fire god. I mean, they did all kinds of crazy stuff. And so the Lord said, I'm going to keep you guys apart. Y'all got to you're going to look different. You're going to act different. You're going to eat different food. You're not to become acclimated with all these other people because what they'll do, they'll pull you astray. Even today, if you go to New York, Maybe you've seen this on the news uh, here recently. But if you go to New York, and especially if you catch a flight uh, into Israel from New York, you're going to see what's known as Orthodox uh, Jewish people. They may have a, uh, guys may have a black hat on. A lot of times they've got a big curl that comes down here. It hangs down to the side. They'll have black pants on. They look different. Uh, they will carry uh, the box on their wrist. They'll have a box on their forehead. They have scriptures in it. So it's a lot of the Old Testament stuff. They look different. They eat different. They act different. Uh, and they don't intermarry and do that. So they're still uh, part of that Old Testament. What happened was the Lord did that for the point of keeping them pure, but they became arrogant in that. You know, when Jesus would refer to others, you talk about you whitewashed tombs, the Pharisees, how they looked down upon other people. And so what they did, you had the Jewish people who considered themselves to be pure. And when they looked at the Gentiles, they said, hey, you guys intermarried. When we were carried off into captivity, some of y'all were left. Y'all didn't stay pure. You intermarried. And so therefore, we look down upon you. That was the deal. And so what he's doing, he's writing, he's telling the Gentiles, he says, remember who you once were. Okay, verse 12, he says, remember you were separate from Christ. Uh, remember that uh, you were outside, basically, uh, of the commonwealth of Israel. You wasn't chosen for the Messiah to come through. Okay, he says, just remember that. You were strangers to the covenants of promise. You didn't know about the Abrahamic covenant and all that. You were having no hope and without God in this world. I mean, that, that's kind of a downer when you read that like, wow, man, that's who I, You were without God. Now, they had many gods. They were pantheists, so they worshiped many false gods, but they didn't have God. He says, but you had no hope. Let me tell you something that we see today in America. We see a great hopelessness today in America, a great hopelessness. We see people, and I know sometimes you say, hey, man, it's because of the pandemic. It's because of sickness. Look, we have lost uh, church family members to the pandemic. Uh, we have a church family who have been sick. Uh, all of us probably have a family member or a friend or somebody who's tested positive, who's quarantined. You know, all of us, we, we wear the mask and we're like, man, we don't like these masks. And I'll be glad when we don't have to wear these masks. I mean, hey, how many of y'all using hand sanitizer? Washing your hands more than normal. Anybody doing that? I'm ready to put my fingers in my mouth. I'm ready for that, right? To eat a big greasy cheeseburger, not be, we probably, I probably won't ever do that again. But yeah, you know what I mean? We, we have all these concerns. You say, well, the pandemic has caused a hopelessness. Nope. Nope, it hasn't. The pandemic has revealed the hopelessness that has always existed. It really has. The economy hasn't caused the hopelessness. The economy has revealed the hopelessness that has always existed. Folks, this this hopelessness, it's like there's nothing for the future. You know, why am I here? Jesus Christ is the only one who can fill that void. Jesus, you know, when we talk about the hope in the Lord God, it's not a wishful thinking. It's based upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. Look, uh, you know, here, here's what we know. We live in a crazy time. We live in a difficult time. But as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life and nobody can take our name out of that book. Come on. Hey, man. Hey, you know what? Hey, I, I want to live for tomorrow. I want to live tomorrow and I want to eat another greasy cheeseburger and I want to stick my fingers in my mouth, okay, with a big fried chicken leg, all right? Now, I, I want to do that, but hey, you know what? If that doesn't ever occur, hey, Jesus is on the throne. Uh, he loves us. We belong to him. Hey, this is temporary, but he has us here for such a time as this. So he's reminding the Gentiles, he says, this is who you were. You were outside. You were without God in the world. We were one time the enemies 
of the Lord. But here's the good news, okay? But now, as believers, we are of the family of God. We've moved from the enemy of God to the family of God. So in 13, here's that word again, but now, okay? But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, okay, talking about the Gentiles, without God, outside the covenant, not knowing the promises, not of the chosen people, that's who you guys were. You had false gods out here. He says, that's who you were. He said, far off, but you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. You realize as the family of God, as men and women of the Lord God, as boys and girls who belong to the Lord God, those who are believers uh, in the Lord Jesus, do you realize that we are unified by the blood of Christ? Do you realize this morning what unifies us? Look, I've got some Scottish stuff in me. They don't like us over there. They won't even talk to us. We got some Indian and we got other stuff all mixed up, okay, uh, in us. That's just kind of uh, who we are. I don't know where you're from. I don't know your background. I don't know how you were brought up, but the common denominator we have is we are unified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is what forgives us of our sins, okay? We are all sinners uh, in need of a Savior. Maybe our sin has manifested itself uh, in different ways. Maybe the sin uh, in your life before Christ manifested itself in adultery. Maybe it manifested itself in homosexuality. Maybe it manifested itself in drunkenness like it did in my life. Maybe it manifests itself in drug abuse. Uh, in your life. Maybe that's what happened, but you got to realize we are unified and covered under the blood of Jesus as the body of Christ, as the local body, the faith family here at Central Baptist Church, we're on a level playing ground. You, you need to understand that. And when the Lord looks at us, you know how he sees us? Does he look out across this? So picture this, God is spirit. We worship in spirit uh, and in truth. We know there's fire that comes from his throne. We see that uh, in Old Testament passages. We know uh, it's a big throne. It's on like a sea of sapphire. Uh, it's transparent. There's a lot of meaning that. He can see everything else we're going. Uh, Jesus has a resurrected body, a Jewish uh, man resurrected body. I picture him with dark eyes and hair and, you know, probably tanned skin and uh, like that, nail scars in his hand and nail scars in his feet. And when he looks at us, what does he see? You say, well, he sees that I struggle. Oh, yeah, he sees that because he's God, okay? Uh, well, I've, I'm a believer, but I've made mistakes. Yes, yes, he sees that. He knows that. We know that he doesn't hold our sin against us. It's as far as his east is from the west and it's buried in the depths of the sea. And I'm like, praise the Lord, uh, hallelujah. You say, well, uh, he sees me. I'm just trying to make it day by day. Let me tell you how he sees it. He sees you in white raiment. That's how he sees you. He sees you as he sees you in heaven. He sees you clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, clothed by the blood of his son that he sent to the cross to die for our sins. That's how the Lord Jesus, when he looks at, you know what you do? You look at your children that are, uh, we'll say, uh, came uh, from you, you gave birth to, you look at them differently than maybe you do other children, not that, you know, you like other people and love other kids, that kind of stuff, but they're your kids. That's how the Lord, when he views us and he sees us, you see, we are unified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as part of the faith family. So he says, for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. It's a bunch right in here, okay? Stay with me. You had the Jews, you had the Gentiles. In the temple, there was the court of the Gentiles. I believe that that is the area where they were selling of the animals when Jesus cleansed the temple, okay? Court of Gentiles. There was a sign that hung up and I didn't write down verbatim what it was, but it basically says to a Gentile, if you come past this area, we're gonna kill you. It was something like that. They could not go into the other part of the temple. They were to be separate. So you had the Jews, okay, who looked down upon the Gentiles. You realize I read one commentator this uh, week that said the reason that God brought about uh, the court of the Gentiles was so that the Jews could do evangelism. That's kind of wild, and I never thought about that. He said it was in God's purpose for the Jews to evangelize them, they just didn't do it like that, okay? And uh, so, he had the core of the Gentiles, but he breaks down the dividing wall where one group is not thinking that they're better than the other group. And it says he brings peace and that he turns the two, Jew and Gentile, into one. Do you realize there's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's only Christian? Do you realize there's no black, there's no white, there's no Hispanic, there's no Asian, there's only Christian? Do you realize that racism and Christianity do not go together? 
You know that's like oil and water? You cannot call yourself a Christian and be a racist according to the word of God. God is not a respecter of persons. Hey, are we all different? Do we have different backgrounds? <laughs> yes. Are we born in different places? Could be, we be Latino? Could we be uh, from China or from Japan? Yes, did God created us and make us, but in his eyes, we are, yes, different people, but we are Christian. Racism and Christianity does not go together. Racism is not from the Lord, okay? Now, has it existed? Yes. Do we see it in the Jews and the Gentiles? Yes. You know, when I, well, y'all know my history. Let me preface it by this. So uh, I wasn't saved. And I had a lot of interesting friends uh, when I wasn't saved. And I had a big friend that was about 6'5", was a cowboy, uh, had a handlebar mustache, was about as, he wasn't as wide as he was tall. He was just a big old farm strong country guy, okay? Uh, but he had a deep-seated hatred for hippies. Hippies. Now, this is the 80s. Now, I don't know. I'm dating myself here. The 80s was the girls had big hairdo, you know, makeup. I can remember all of it. I'm not going to bring Angie into it, but anyhow, I had that. But it was also a time, and, you know, so I, I think back about this, and I, and, uh, I just wondered why did he have that hatred? Because you think, well, what, who, what is a hippie? Who is a hippie? What is that? Well, in the 80s, it, you'd see, there were guys, and I had this, I had this uh, bi-level thing going on in the back. Let me tell you what, I look good, too. I want you to know, it's bi-level. And uh, well, anyway, Angie thought I looked good. Let me say that. But, uh, but you, there were guys with long hair, okay? Now, nothing against long hair, not doing that. But I'm just trying to make this statement. For some reason, this guy with a handlebar mustache wore a big black cowboy hat, felt in the winter, white straw in the summer, big as a barn. He had a deep-seated hatred. We come out of a convenience store one time, and, you know, I don't remember. I, I, I'm visual, so I remember this. There's a, there was a Trans Am that pulled up in front of the convenience store, and we're walking out. You know, Trans Am, big long hood on it, big eagle on the front, T-tops, big mag wheels, run about 180 miles per hour. Y'all with me? Come on. I mean, probably Chicago or the Eagles were blaring on the, on the radio, you know. And we walk out of the convenience store, and my friend looks over, and he says, that's a hippie. Now, me, when I was with him, I was invisible, you know, and, and bulletproof, I thought, because he was so big. He takes off running, jumps through the windows and the T-top of the Trans Am on two guys we have never met before and starts frailing on them. You know what frailing is? This picture... 280 pounds with his boots hanging out of the door on the window, and he's just grabbing and snatching, and people, huh? It's not funny, but it was something. Why is that? He hated them. Why did he hate them? I have no idea. You say, was, is that racism? No, that's just hatred. You can't be a Christian cowboy and hate hippies. Do you hear me? You, you can't say, well, you know, I don't know why so-and-so will do that. People do what they do because they're lost. Please understand that. But when he says there, he says, what the Lord did, he says, by his blood. We're unified by his blood. And what he's done, he's broke down the dividing walls. When Jesus died on that cross, he died for everybody. You know, I can remember, I've shared this before here. When I was in seminary, um, we were all kind of young preacher boys or whatever, which I was 30, but another guy was about 30, and he was pastoring a church in central southern Arkansas. And he came in one day, and he was very broken. Now, this would have been 1996, 97. He came in, here's what he said. He said, man, I'm very discouraged. He said, why? He said, I have one of my deacons who's teaching in a Sunday school class that someone who has a black skin, African-American, does not have a soul. Did you hear that? Now, you said, is that wrong? Well, yes, it's wrong. Why would somebody in a Baptist church who's a deacon do that? Because he's wrong. You cannot be a racist and call yourself a Christian. Those two did not go together. And when Jesus died on that cross, he says, I brought peace. I, brought, I broke down the dividing wall. Now, particularly there, Jew and Gentile, I broke it down. And he said, I preached the gospel to those who were close Talking about the Jews, they weren't, you know, those who were close, but those who were far off. You see, 
We once were his enemies, but now we've become his family, and his family's made up of all of us from all different backgrounds and all different walks of life, but also as a family, okay? Not only are we unified by the blood of Christ, hey, there's no room, uh, he's not a respecter of persons and that kind of stuff, but also that we have access uh, in one spirit to the Father. So as believers, as a family of God, we have access to come before him and cry out, Abba, Father. Just as a son or a daughter would go to their dad and at any time in the middle of the night and know they have complete freedom to call out. That's what he tells us. As a family member, being a family of God, it's got benefits, okay, to it. We can come before the Lord. We have access through the blood of the Lord Jesus. So in verse 19, he says, so then you're no longer strangers and aliens, okay? You're no longer separated. You're no longer different, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You are of God's household, okay? We are part of God's household. My last name is Mason. Your last name may be, I don't know, whatever. Uh, But we are of God's household. Let me tell you something about my household too. How many of you, raise your hand if you take out the trash, okay? Uh, Raise your hand if you're responsible for like washing the dishes. Raise your hand if you're like responsible for washing clothes, okay? I could go on and on. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, by the way, right? Uh, At my house, there's no freeloading at my house, Y'all with me? Come on. I'm going to help some of y'all right here. You're not going to remember anything else, but you are going to remember this. There's no freeloading at my house. Any household that's a functioning household, look, uh, you know, I, I, I would tell my kids, look, God didn't call me to pick your clothes up out of the floor. You can pick your own clothes up out of the floor. Come on. Y'all need some help. Y'all need some help. I'm going to help you. There's no freeloading, okay? Everybody has a job. Here, some of you teenagers, y'all look at me right here. I think after this message, with great contrition of heart, that means brokenness, you need to go to your parents and you need to say, forgive me for being a freeloader. I want you to give me some chores. I want you to give me a job to do. You've been picking up my clothes and you've been washing my clothes and you've been feeding my face and you've been picking my plate up off the table, but... Will you give me a job, mama? Will you give me a job, daddy? Come on. Oh, yeah, y'all not fired up. You see, there's no freeloading in the household. There's really not. It's not supposed to be like that, okay? Now, we're of the household of God. Now, I'm going to make a point with this, so here we go, okay? He says this. He says, God's household, you're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, talking about the gospel, okay, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, and Christ Jesus himself being a cornerstone. In an ancient building, there would be a cornerstone. It's cut perfectly. I called my dad-in-law the other day. I said, do you know how to square a building? He said, how big a building you got? I said, well, I don't know. Depends on how much it's going to cost. I said, but I just want to build a shed, but I can't square it. I don't know how to make it square. So, Stuff's not at an angle, you know, and it it squared off. He said, yeah, I can do it. Well, a cornerstone, that was part of that cornerstone. It could square up a building, but it was the foundational stone. It was perfect and how it was cut in the quarry, and it was laid, and everything else was built upon it. So here's what the Lord says. He says, we are of the household of God, and we're built on the foundation, Jesus being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Okay. I got two bricks. They're kind of wet because I left them out in the truck uh, last night. I brought them in uh, this morning. But here, uh, this is you and this is me, okay? We each are brick. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, we're square. Well, it's okay. Just stay with me, okay? It's illustration. But we're brick. We're stone. When you got saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, you were filled with the Spirit of God. Your name is written in the Lamb's uh, book, of the Lord. Uh, you have a mansion in glory. There's going to be streets of gold. You know, it's all the stuff. You've been forgiven. You have made righteous. You're white as snow. Uh, past, present, future sins, okay? So that's you. Me, same thing, okay? This is who we are. But what the Lord does is that he tells us that he fits us together. He's the cornerstone. He's the common denominator, but he fits us together as believers, and we become the body. We're growing into that holy temple uh, in the church. Now, what he's done also, he's given each of us a spiritual gift. We each have a spiritual gift. You could have the gift of teaching, the gift of administration, the gift of serving, the gift of prophecy, which is like a black and white uh, thinker. You could have the gift of mercy, you know, or what's called the gift of helps in that idea too. So what he does is he puts us together. You realize, hey, we're strong as an individual believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you need to understand this. We're better together 
than we are apart. You know, God has set this thing up as a church. Do you realize that a church, okay, now again, let me go back to this. Let me help you with this. There's no free loading in the church. We're of God's household. He's gifted us. He, do you realize as we're linked together, we each depend on one another. God has gifted you. God has given you a job. God has given you a place of service. You say, well, what is it? Well, I don't know. Just get with the Lord and figure it out. You know, maybe it's greeting at the door, you know, or being in a crowd. I don't know. It could be anything. It's how you're gifted. And what he's done is that he's put us together. And what it does, it makes us strong when we exercise our spiritual gifts, when we be who we're supposed to be in God's household, and he cements us together. We're better together than we are apart. That is a church. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, has chosen to work through his church, okay? So he says we're growing into a holy temple. Now, that can have the idea of sanctification, growing in the knowledge and understanding of the Lord, but also in people being saved and people becoming part of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you realize that the church is the hope of the world? Now, I didn't come up with that. I didn't, that's not original. I may have heard that somewhere. Do you realize the church is the hope of the world? Do you realize the church is God's plan A and there's no plan B? Did you hear me on that? Do you realize that the church is the hope of the world, that the church is God's plan A and there is no plan B? Now, here's the last part of this verse before we close. Last part of this passage, very important. He says in uh, verse 22, in whom also you're being built together. Okay, so you think about being connected, cemented on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. Why are the Jews so uh, serious, and if we say emphatic necessarily on the rebuilding of the temple? Number one, they cannot have forgiveness of sins, okay, in their belief system, because see, they don't receive, they're not accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah. They have missed the Messiah, so they're still hung over here and hung back. Why are they so emphatic about rebuilding the temple? Because they can't have forgiveness of sin unless an animal gets its throat cut, that's why. That's how they view that, okay? Number two, and they have made this statement, some of you were there when we toured Israel and you heard it, when the rabbi in the Temple Institute made a statement, we know where the Ark of the Covenant is located, okay? So, you know, the big ark with the angels on it and all that stuff. But number two, they want the temple rebuilt because it represents the presence of God. They are still wanting the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God to come down. So they can't have forgiveness of sin unless an animal gets his throat cut and blood is shed, Old Testament style. And then they want the temple because they believe that's going to house the presence of God. But what does the Lord say in the New Testament, okay? Right here he says in this uh, last verse, he says, you are being built together into the dwelling of God in the Spirit. Do you, rep do you understand that the church today... The church today, the local body, this local faith family should be filled with the presence of God. If you're looking around and you think, well, I don't sense the presence of God, then we might want to ask ourselves, why not? Why do we not sense the presence of God? Why would the presence of God not be here? Why are we not experiencing the presence of God? I've shared this with you before. One second. Hey, Nathan, I'm going to go ahead and ask you guys to come up. One second in the presence of God can do more in your life emotionally, mentally, physically, uh, intellectually. One second, the presence of God it will do more in your life than anything else. We need the presence of God. Now you say, well, we're a brick, and when we get saved, we're sealed by the Spirit of God. Yes, we're, we've been given a job by the Spirit of God. Yes, we all have a spiritual gift, yes. And we come together, but we got to ask ourselves that the Lord lives within us. If we come together on a Sunday morning, are we experiencing the presence of God? Do we sing like we are experiencing the presence of God? Do we dive into God's word like we're experiencing the presence of God? Are you hungry for the presence of God? Do you want the presence of God to move and work? Because again, the church is the hope of the world, okay? Because the church is, uh, the Lord has chosen to work through the church, work through his body, uh, his corporate body, local churches for the spread of the gospel. The church is God's plan A. There's not any plan B. Jesus died on the cross, yes, for us. But he, he wants to work through the church for the spread of the gospel. But the, us as believers, as the being built into the building, we should have the presence of God. 
You know, the presence of God should be moving and working, but it, it may be that we don't actually want the presence of God. Because what happens in a corporate gathering, when the presence of God moves and works, you realize there are unbelievers who may just fall on their face in the midst of a corporate gathering and, and really just mess up your fried chicken lunch that you're thinking about. Do you realize that there could be an unbeliever in a corporate gathering and the presence of God, we'll just say it this way, not mystical, not weird, but the presence of God is just thick. The Holy Spirit of the Lord is moving and working. The, the Lord is drawing people to himself. He's wanted to adopt people into the kingdom of God and to be a part of the faith family. And, and folks are just like, man, what is going on? And what happened? People start repenting of sin. People start getting right. That's the presence of God. People sing with joy to the Lord God Almighty who died on the cross for them. If we're not experiencing the presence of God, we might want to ask ourselves why. Why not? So here's our invitation, okay? For those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are you hungry for the presence of God? And if you say, Archie, I'm, I'm walking with the Lord. I'm experiencing the presence of God in a, in a daily way. I say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Maybe you just want to pray for the church corporately to just experience the presence of God. It may be that there may be some place in your life where it's just disobedience, there's just sin. And you say, man, I need to repent and confess. And it may be the altar is just open. You just, maybe you just want to come down and kneel. Maybe you just want to get on your face so and really just say, Lord, we just need a move of you. Because here's the deal. If, uh, if God doesn't show up in this nation, and when I say we pray for revival, revival starts with God's people. And my opinion, that means revival is going to start in the Lord's church, in his faith family, and it's going to go from there. But if God does not show up, <laughs> we are in trouble. Do y'all understand that? The enemy is crazy. Satan is crazy. He wants to take as many people to hell with him as possible. And he is about the culmination of history. He's wanting to drive this thing down. And you see, prayer moves God. We don't understand it. And it may be you just want to pray and say, man, we just need the presence of you, Lord. We need revival. You may want to pray. You know what we need to pray? It's not me. You just say, God, give us another chance. Maybe we need to repent on behalf of our nation, that we have people who want to take the lives of babies right up to the day they're going to be physically born. Oh, God, forgive us. Oh, God, forgive us that we would even think that way. Maybe we got to repent on behalf of our nation. It, you know, it's, it cried out and said, I live among, Isaiah, I live among people of unclean lips, Lord. Lord, give us another chance. Lord, put your hand on us. And if the Lord says, I'm going to put my hand on the local church, and we need to say, God, put your hand on us, and whatever comes with that comes with it, we welcome it. But let us be a lighthouse for your kingdom. Let us be the lighthouse. We're the last stop before the pit of hell. God, put your hand on us and let us experience your presence in our lives as a church. Let us be found faithful when you come. Maybe that's our prayer today. Do you want the presence of God? We need it. But also, too, I know there are unbelievers here. Man, here's the good news. You know what the Lord's doing? He's drawing you. Come unto me, all you weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. That's what he's saying. You're hopeless. You've gone down a path of alcohol, immorality, careers. It's hopelessness. He is the one who will give you rest and peace. That's when it says he brought peace. He'll give you peace. You got to come to him in repentance. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I repent. Lord Jesus, take control of my life. I surrender everything to you. Something, sincerity, faith, repentance. No magical words calling upon him. He'll save you. That's the good news. He died on the cross for you. This is our invitation. What do we want God to do? We're going to have to ask him, and we're going to have to pray. So the altar is going to be open. Father, we bow in the name of Jesus. 
because there's nobody else. Lord, we need your presence. Lord, we need you to move. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us where we failed. Forgive us where we not spoken. Forgive us where we've been lethargic. Lord, give us another chance as a nation. Give us another chance as a church. Lord, put your hand on us. Fill us with your spirit. Move and work. And Lord, I pray, draw somebody in your family today. Save somebody today. May you adopt somebody. Graft them in to the family, Lord. In your name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Can we stand to our feet, please? Pastors are here.